everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Oh Shoot. I'm your host, Cassidy Lynn, and welcome back to another episode. Happy Monday. I hope you're having a great start to your week. I hope everything this week is going to go so smoothly for you. Personally, I this week am going to Charleston, which is super exciting. I'm speaking at um, like a retreat called Photo Camp. And yeah, we're going for, I think it's either like three or four nights. Obviously, I only have like one obligation, which is like speaking at this thing. But I was like, I've never been to Charleston, so I'm going to live it up. We're going to go for a couple days, explore the town, see what there is to see. So yeah, we're going to Charleston this week. I'm really excited. And the week after that actually is my Oh Shoot pop-up party. So all you guys are listening, you're all Oh Shoot listeners, and you can come to my pop-up party. I have a few tickets left, so go to the Oh Shoot Instagram. They're linked there. Um, it's going to be super fun. I've got like gift bags for everyone. We're going to have exclusive merch. There's going to be a live recording. You're going to be able to submit questions for the recording. Um, I don't know if I'm going to release that recording it might just be only for in-person listeners. There's going to be signature drinks. You're going to get drink tickets at the door. It's going to be so fun. Okay. And I'm so excited. So go get tickets. Um, like I said, there's a couple left. Today's episode, I will warn you guys, I was not expecting this episode to be as juicy as it is. Okay. So I was sitting and I was like, what are we going to talk about this week? what haven't I talked about on the podcast? And there's one topic that always comes to my mind that I've been a little afraid to talk about because I just, you know, I'm like, I don't want to get in trouble by certain companies. I don't want people to come for me. Um, I definitely don't want to like attack companies. However, there's one topic that I have never talked about. And I think now is the time to do that. And today we're talking about the knot (laughs) and whether or not the knot is a scam. I'm going to be straight up with you guys. We're going to dive into it. And we're also going to talk about the TikTok ban as well. So this episode is juicy because, you know, I was like, oh, I'll just talk about my experience on the knot. Um, Maybe add a few things in here and there. Well, I start doing my research and, you know, when the tea is presented to you, you have to present it to others. Like literally all I did was some research and I started to dig deep into this and I was like, whoa, this is way bigger and a way bigger issue than I knew. And it goes beyond just wedding vendors. It's crazy. So We're going to be talking about the knot today. And first we're talking about the TikTok ban, because this is another question I keep getting asked. Um, And I mean, I did my research on this as well. Uh, Basically, I'm a reporter today. If you're watching on YouTube, I have my mic on like a little side table today. So I'm technically hands free. And that's because I am in my reporter mode right now. Like I am ready to report to you the news that you need to know. So first we're going to talk about the TikTok ban. And I know I'm a couple weeks late with this. I think at this point it was like March 14th or 15th that all of this started going down. However, I wanted a little bit to just really sit on it, really think about, okay, what's happening? What can we do about it? So is TikTok going to get banned? That is the big question that everyone has. And the answer I have for you is maybe, maybe it will, maybe it won't. And I'll tell you why. So obviously I did my research. Um, I did see a lot of videos like on TikTok, off of TikTok. I saw a lot of opinions. However, I think the most important thing for me to do was to go and like, I read actual articles that source like a bunch of different things. And I think articles are very helpful for serious issues like this. And also for our next topic, the not very helpful to read articles to obviously get opinions from people, but to just make sure 
the facts are there, you know, their sources, all of that. So I found an article on NPR and this was probably the most helpful article for me. I feel like it really dumbed it down for me because I'm not like some TikTok technology savage person. Like I just want to know, will I be able to continue to use TikTok? That's really my question. Like, I don't care about the politics behind it. I don't just tell me yes or no. Right. So I feel like this article was really helpful. So I'm just going to read a couple of little blurbs from this article and then give you guys some takeaways and you can kind of draw your own conclusions as to what you think is going to happen. Um, so the house of representatives passed legisl- legislation. How do you even say that word legislation on Wednesday, which I don't actually know like what date this was at this point. Um, I think this was March 13th, maybe on Wednesday, giving TikTok two choices to either find a buyer for the immensely popular video app or face a nationwide ban in the U S. So that was basically the two choices that TikTok was given, find a buyer or get banned. Okay. (laughs) Which is very drastic. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're drawing conclusions over here. Like do we not have other alternatives besides literally banning the app or it being bought? Like, I don't know. It's crazy. President Biden has indicated that he would sign the law, but first it must clear the Senate where it faces an uncertain future. Several other anti TikTok efforts in the Senate have stalled and it is too soon to tell whether the house house's legislation will meet a different fate. So there have been other efforts to ban TikTok. I don't know if you guys remember, but there's been like talk of TikTok getting banned like multiple times. And I just remember being like, okay, like, can you actually do that? It doesn't feel like you can just do that. Like just ban TikTok. That seems crazy. And like in the past, nothing has come of it. Like this article said, like other efforts have stalled. However, this effort might be different because the first like part of it, it going to the House of Representatives it actually passed. So like, that's kind of crazy. Um, there's no way to make TikTok disappear for the 170 million Americans who have already downloaded it. Okay. So that's an important thing to note. But removing TikTok from the app store would mean that users would not be able to download any further software updates. So it's kind of like the whole Flappy Bird situation. You guys remember Flappy Bird just like disappeared from the app store same vibes. Like it would, you'd still be able to have it on your phone, but like it wouldn't update. And like, that would be a problem. Um, experts say without the ability to update regularly, the app would become slow, glitchy, buggy, and rife with other people's wait, what? And rife with other problems to the point where using it at all would just be about impossible. In other words, TikTok would die a slow, gradual death rather than a swift demise. So if it does get banned, you can still have it on your phone, but like eventually the software just like will stop working and it just won't work well. Like it's just kind of what would happen. Um, People could turn to a a virtual private network or VPNs to shield their location and get past restrictions. The technique is popular in places like Russia and China, where governments have prohibited many popular internet apps and services. So there's actually a popular um, like VPN thing going around. I heard an ad for it on a podcast that I listened to, and it's basically to get around like your location, like basically you your phone or your computer doesn't know where you're based, so you have access to like everything that everyone has access to. Um, so. I don't know if that's potentially a solution. Like if TikTok gets banned, maybe literally everyone goes and downloads a VPN app and that's the end of it. Like we all have VPN apps and we still have TikTok and the world continues to spin around and that's it. So that could be a solution. Um, Seems like if you have a VPN company, you better start getting that app ready to sell. Get it ready. It is all but certain that TikTok will try to have a ban overturned in the courts. So if it does get banned, if TikTok does get banned, it's likely that TikTok is going to try to overturn that. Legal experts say that shutting down a social media platform in the name of national security is something that can only be accomplished if the security threat is overwhelming. 
Otherwise, it will likely be considered an infringement of the First Amendment rights of millions of Americans if the government cannot show that the speech constraint is justified. So this is this point really made me feel secure in my conclusion that I do not think TikTok's going to get banned because, okay, they're saying it's a national threat. However, is it not also a violation of our First Amendment rights to take away something that allows us to have freedom of speech? Like by taking that away, like you're literally violating right, like First Amendment rights. So I don't know. I, I feel like I'm like 65% sure it won't, it won't actually go away. 35% of me is like, it might. So let me just give you some of my takeaways. Okay. Um, number one, I don't think it's going anywhere for the next year. So I don't think TikTok is going to go away within the next year because even if this ban gets passed, basically TikTok has six months to find a buyer and it's already gone through. What did they say? House of legislation, house of representatives. (laughs) I don't know anything political. I'm so sorry, guys. So it's already gone through the House of Representatives and been passed, but it still has to go through, I believe, Senate. And then I think the president, don't quote me on that, but it's got to go through other systems and get passed before it becomes official. And then once it becomes official, then it has six months. So in my head, that's like a total of a year before anything really happens where it would actually be taken away from the app store. So personally, in the next year, I don't think it's going to go away. Um, I think because people are scared that TikTok's going to get banned and that it's going to go away, I think it's a really good time to get in on TikTok. I think people are scared and so they're kind of gravitating away from TikTok a little bit. But you know how all these things work, right? People gravitate away from Instagram and then they come crawling back, right? Like people gravitate away from TikTok and then there's a resurgence. And then everyone comes back to TikTok. So I think now is a great time to get in on TikTok. I will say I noticed some of my views have been a little bit down on TikTok. Could be a content thing. Could be my problem. I'm not going to say it's not. But that is something to think about. Maybe my views are being affected because a lot of people are gravitating away from TikTok. Either way, I think now would be a great time to kind of get in on the TikTok wave. Um... I think personally, like it's kind of giving a similar vibe to like in 2020 when COVID hit and like a bunch of people started blowing up on TikTok and now they have these crazy careers. I think something like that is going to happen soon. If it's not with TikTok, I do think a new app will emerge or something similar is going to emerge. And I would just tell you guys, like, keep your eyes open for something like that. If you start to notice like there's talk of a new app or whatever, maybe give that new app a try because I know a lot of the times, like a lot of people say, Oh, I wish I would have started posting on TikTok like right when I found out about it, but I was just hesitant and skeptical. I think in this day and age, we can't be skeptical. In fact, we have to just like really adapt to whatever we see emerging. And then if it dies off, okay, that's fine. Wasted effort. No, because you still built an audience and stuff. So um, I would say get ready to try something new. Um, don't be too stubborn. Like, I think the people that are really successful in the social media marketing world are the people that are just willing to try new apps and new things and see what works, see what strategies work. And then if, you know, if it starts to die off, like threads, for example, like a lot of people were hopping on threads, trying out different strategies, but it did start to die off a little bit. And I think, I mean, I don't really know anyone that uses threads anymore, but like we tried and I think it was a fun little thing. So I would say keep an eye out for anything new that's going to emerge in the next couple of months. Um, okay. So now let's get into the real juice of the day, the knot. Okay. And I, I want to let you guys know, I've talked about my experience on that a little bit, and I'll tell you that my experience was just okay. It wasn't incredible, but it wasn't the worst experience ever. I will say that my experience on the knot was in around 
2018, 2017, 2018, mm, a little bit 2019. Oh, wait, I think it was 2018, 2019, and then I stopped in 2020, I think. But regardless, my experience was okay. And I went and found a bunch of articles to back up this whole story. So basically, when I was doing my research, I was like, I'm just going to go dig around, see what I can find out about the knot, because I've heard of people having not the best experiences. In doing my research, I discovered that the knot has had issues long before it was even the knot. So there have been sketchy things going on with the knot before it was even the knot. It was, I think it was called the XO group or something like that is what it was called before it was the knot. And basically this group would work with places like Macy's and David's Bridal and they would guarantee like a certain amount of ad reach and um like they would be like oh we'll run these ads to like x amount of people and we're selling ads to Macy's or David's Bridal or these big companies and basically they were not they didn't actually have the audience like and they weren't actually able to get these ads in front of enough people that they were guaranteeing. So there was like this whole thing where it was like, like they were promising stuff to these big companies and then their ads like weren't actually amounting to what they were promising. And that was long before the knot actually became the knot. And now the knot is not even the knot. It's the knot and wedding wire teamed up and now it's called like wedding pro, I think. So let me tell you about these articles I found. So I found an article on the Better Business Bureau.org. Okay, that's a big deal. That's an official website. The New York Post and Forbes, those are three different articles I found. Um, and then I found this crazy thread on Reddit, which I'll read at the end because that's more just like opinions and experiences. But I want to give you guys like the legit, legit. Okay. So the Better Business Bureau.org is basically like a website where people can go and like say that they had a bad experience or like someone's not giving them their money back or like someone is conducting business in like a shady or sketchy way. And it's it's basically like a organization to make sure that businesses are being held accountable and like customers are able to, you know, have an impact on their experience. Like they're experience can kind of impact these businesses through the Better Business Bureau. So on specifically for The Knot, there were 10 people um, who tried canceling their yearly contract after a year was up and they couldn't get out of it, Um, which in my opinion is a lot of people. And it was just like within, I would say the last like, you know, couple of years 10 people all saying the same exact thing on this thread. It was crazy. And I mean, the Better Business Bureau would comment and reply and be like, okay, we reached out to them. Like, here's a little bit of a solution. Like they said that they canceled your contract, whatever. But a lot of these people were saying that they would get locked into a yearly contract. Their contract would be up and they would try to cancel and the knot would make it so incredibly hard or nearly impossible for them to cancel. And it's actually technically within their contract, the knots contract that, you know, you get a year long, um, contract, but then after a year they can keep like auto billing you and you have to like go through a really roundabout way to cancel. So that's what a lot of these people are facing. One person on the Better Business Bureau complained about bad reviews being removed from people's not storefronts. So, you know, people go, they have a bad experience, they'll leave a bad review. And on the not, you can request to get certain reviews removed if you would like to. And I mean, I don't really feel like that's the way reviews work unless it's like a legitimate like you know, we've seen instances where people just get mad about an experience and then like 
20, 20 friends of one person go and just absolutely ruin a business through reviews. Like it's not, that's horrible. I hate when that happens. So I do understand like getting reviews removed for that reason. But if someone actually had a bad experience with you and they left a bad review, it's like, why, why would you remove that? And like, that's kind of an issue that a lot of people were saying happened on the knot. Cause then, you know, these businesses are advertising something and maybe they're not delivering 100% on their promises and they go and try to let other people know and make them aware of their experience. And then you can just get that review removed. Like that's crazy. One person said that the knot actually took all of their registry money. So you know how you can do like a wedding registry on the knot and you can like have an option for like the honeymoon option or the honeymoon fund. And instead of someone buying something from your registry, they just give you like money towards your honeymoon or something like that. So the knot is supposed to like give you that money. But one person claimed that the knot took the money. There was like this random like routing number and bank account number linked to their account that they had never seen before. And like they weren't able to get the money from their registry which is truly heartbreaking. Like if your friends and family are giving you money for your wedding and then you never see that money, that's horrible. Okay. All of this is kind of reminding me of this podcast I just listened to. It's called the wedding scammer and it's a relatively newer podcast. Like I think it's come out in like the last year or something like that, but it's seven episodes and it's about literally it's called the wedding scammer. It's about this guy who gets scammed and then he makes it kind of like his life mission to find this person who scammed him and figure out his whole life story and whatnot. It's, it's really good. It had me hooked. So, um, if you like hearing about like the true crime of it all, go listen to that podcast. It's really good. Okay. So now let's go to the New York post article that I found. This one was crazy because it went and like interviewed ex employees at the knot which I think is a very valuable like perspective in all of this. We can speculate all we want. We can hear things from photographers and wedding vendors. But when we start to hear things from behind the scenes of people who have worked there and have seen how things flow, that's when things start to get interesting. So ex-employees spoke out about the knot allegation. So there's been a lot of allegations about the knot saying, you know, the knot sends wedding vendors fake leads. Um, you know, they'll lock you into a contract. You can't get out of it. Like there's all these allegations against the knot. So here's a quote from the article. Hi guys, it's Cassidy, and I'm gonna show you the fastest way to edit your photos. I like to use AI in my workflow to speed up my editing and culling process, and that's why I use Aftershoot. Let me show you how I do it. So first, I'm gonna go into Aftershoot, and I'm gonna create a new album. Then I'm gonna choose the raw JPEG option, and I'm gonna locate my raws. You'll notice that in Aftershoot, I can very easily switch between the cull and edit tab, and it just makes for an overall seamless experience. Now I'm gonna switch to the cull tab, and I'm gonna have Aftershoot cull my photos with AI assisted culling. And once I hit the cull button, Aftershoot's actually gonna give me the option between AI automated culling and AI assisted culling. Today, I'm gonna use the AI automated culling. Then Aftershoot's gonna ask me what type of shoot this is. I'm going to say that it is an engagement shoot. And I actually wanna be super selective with this specific gallery. So I'm gonna have Aftershoot only select a few amount of photos for me. And then I'm gonna hit the start culling button and Aftershoot is going to work its magic. What I love about Aftershoot is they have a marketplace where they have over 30 pre-built profiles for you to choose from. You can go in and preview any pre-built style in the marketplace and you can use the little sliders to see before and afters on different photos and what it would look like. I'm just gonna go in quickly and review all the photos and make sure that I like all the ones that it's selected. And now that I've reviewed all the photos, I'm gonna export these 92 photos. Aftershoot allows you to export one click into a bunch of different platforms. I can do Lightroom Classic, I can export to Lightroom, or I can export to Capture One. Now you can export edited images to Bridge, Photoshop, and Lightroom Cloud. 
What I love about this is it makes the process so seamless going between Aftershoot and your editing platform. Now I'm gonna switch over to the edit tab in Aftershoot and I'm going to work on getting my photos edited using Aftershoot's AI assisted editing. I do wanna note that I made my own Matcha Glow profile under the AI profile options within Aftershoot. So this is my own personal AI profile that I prefer to use for my editing style. So that is what I'm going to choose when I'm doing the editing portion of this video. It's super easy to make your own customized AI profile in Aftershoot. Or like I said earlier, you can always head on over to the marketplace and check out the options there. So I'm gonna select the Matcha Glow profile. What I love about Aftershoot is they just added this new crop feature and they allow you to crop super custom so you can actually choose to crop loose or aggressive and I'm gonna choose aggressive in this case and you can also choose a custom ratio if you have a specific cropping ratio that you prefer I'm going to leave mine as default and I'm gonna hit edit photos now I'm gonna let after shoot edit my photos for me and I can take a break and come back to see if my photos are ready another thing that I love about after shoot is they have 24 7 online support if you ever feel like you need help with something you have a technical issue you can hop right onto the Aftershoot app, go to their online support section and get help there. The best part about Aftershoot is it takes minutes. It hardly takes any time for all of my photos to get edited. I think in total for these 92 photos that I edited with Aftershoot, it took a total of maybe two minutes to cull and edit my photos. And now I can go in Aftershoot and just review all the different edits that it made to all of my images. I exported my photos from Aftershoot right into Lightroom Classic and I can just go in and review my edits here. Honestly, Aftershoot did a great job editing all my photos. They're exactly how I would have edited them. So I'm super happy with how this gallery turned out. Aftershoot allows you to seamlessly edit your raw photos right within Aftershoot. This allows you to expand your editing capabilities beyond Lightroom catalogs or Capture One sessions. All the more reason to check out Aftershoot and try it today. Aftershoot is seriously a game changer when it comes to editing and culling your photos. If you wanna take your editing time from hours to minutes, Try Aftershoot for yourself at the link in the description. Aftershoot is also offering a free 30-day trial for all Oshoot listeners. So guys, make sure to check out the link in the description of this episode. I promise you, Aftershoot is going to change your editing game. Thank you so much for watching and let's get back to the show. The former employees claim that the Knott's former parent company, XO Group, lied to major corporate clients for years as it charged a premium for ads to be targeted for particular customers, such as brides searching for dresses in a given market, even though the company knew it lacked the inventory to satisfy the terms three former employees allege. So that's what I was talking about with before the knot even became the knot. They had these major corporate clients that they were working with saying that they could target ads for particular customers, even though they didn't have the inventory to do so. And that's just kind of like, it's slimy. Okay. It's deceiving. And if that's kind of what your company is based off of, then you go in your client, your clients start to become wedding vendors, right? That's where it's like, okay, now it's getting slimy towards wedding vendors. Because if you think of the knot as a whole, the not wedding wire wedding pros. Okay. Those are all interchangeable terms in this podcast episode because they're all the same thing right now. So when we think of something like wedding pros, basically they are making money from vendors. So they are charging vendors to be on their search page to pop up when someone searches wedding photographer in Michigan these vendors, these photographers are paying to get premium spots on the search engine page. Okay. It's called like a, I think they're called storefronts. So essentially their money comes from vendors and in return, wedding pros is providing leads, clients, bookings, et cetera. And a lot of the times when you are talking with wedding pros on the phone or the not on the phone, and they're trying to sell you on their product, they will tell you like, oh, you're going to make back your money in like the first month. You're going to get a booking in the first month and you'll pay back your entire year of advertising costs within the first month. You're going to get a booking. And sometimes that happens for some people, but that's not always the case. And I think we're finding a lot more recently that really is not the case. Okay. 
So next thing, last year, an insider said that wedding pros had obtained 56 consumer complaints filed against the knot by jilted small business owners through the Federal Trade Commission, including one that alleged about 70 to 80 percent of the leads are scams. Um, This insider says vendors frequently receive unqualified leads that are irrelevant, irrelevant geographically, not specific to the client's business or even with a past due wedding date, according to her own experience and conversations with colleagues who worked with ad clients. So this is crazy because this is a former employee or an insider. Um, and just this insider has conversations with colleagues, people who have worked with these vendors, worked with the not wedding pros saying that 70 to 80% of the leads are literally scam irrelevant. They're not based in the right location. Their wedding date has already happened. Um, you know, stuff that just like is not lining up for a real client. Okay. And when I was on the knot, I do remember quite a bit of just like, it was just very time consuming because I would get a lot of leads. Like I would say every two days you get someone that reaches out, but the amount of people who would actually reply to you, it was like maybe 20, 15% of people would actually get back to you. And besides that, you would just get ghosted. And I think the hard part about the knot was people would like inquire and like reach out, but you had to like reach out via the contact form that's on the knot and they have to like send you a message basically. And then if you reply, it's like all within the knot system. So if they never go back and check their knot account again, they're never going to see the message. Um, or when I was on the knot, I would would always be like, Hey, can I get your email? Um, I'm going to email you my info and we can chat more over there. Um, because I would always try to get people away from the knot because the more you get them away from it, I felt like that more likely they are to book and you're going to have a more streamlined, direct communication with them. Um, so I think I would say it was probably 25% of my inquiries for a while were just coming from the knot. And I was finding that I was getting quite a bit of people who would find me on the knot, but then they would go click on my website and then look at my website and then they would inquire through my website form. And those were the people that were way more likely to book like these random messages I was getting on the knot with these random weddings. Those never really panned out. Um, I will say some of my best weddings, my favorite weddings, I did book through the knot, which is kind of crazy, but I think the knot has kind of gone through its peak already. Like, I feel like it was really popular 2014 to like 2020. And then I think it just started to change, like with a huge, massive increase in social media presence and like all that. I think, you know, people are finding their vendors in easier, more conventional ways. And I mean, there's been a lot of talk around the knot recently too. And I think wedding clients start to hear about that, you know, and you just want nothing to do with it truly. And there have been competitors that have, um, joined the, the competition at this point. So now we have something like Zola. Zola was, you know, it's huge now I feel like, and I, everyone that I know that makes like a registry or whatever, um, they use Zola And I mean, Zola has the option for vendors to pay to be on the storefront and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's competitors. I just feel like the knot has kind of gone through its peak and now it's just kind of like just trying to make money however they can. So I have now some quotes from the, a Forbes article that I found, um, this one was interesting. Um, I loved how these articles found like previous employees and, you know, people that have worked there or people that, um, you know, used to be high ups. They found people that actually had like insider info, which I, you know, I ate that up. I was like, give me more. So, um, I'll just start. This is just a quote. Um, there, 
the there are whistleblowers that are um, quoted in this little section, and their names are Davison, LaFera, and Cindy Ely. Um, and Cindy was an account executive who left the knot in 2021 after 19 years. So I just want you to think about that. What does it take for someone to leave their job that they've been at for 19 years? It's got to be, there's got to be something built up there. Um, the women have alleged the knot where they worked for a combined six decades has been committing. Oh, this is a big. Okay, this is all alleged, okay, has been committing financial fraud for years and that executives, quote, accelerated revenue and orchestrated a textbook pump and dump to drive up the company's stock price before it was sold for almost $1 billion and merged with rival Wedding Wire in 2018. They said the alleged fraud, some of which was first reported by the New York Post, has occurred in local and national the divisions that drive the most revenue and where all three women had worked sales were quote dysfunctional and overstated. They claim quote, I can't believe that they haven't come after them. The wedding wire people, a former top executive at the knot said this year in an audio obtained by Forbes, they bought a crock of, um, what's an alternative for that word? A crock of crap. (laughs) I <laughs> oh, so that's crazy. That's a crazy allegation that before the knot and wedding wire merged, that the knot basically was committing allegedly financial fraud to pump up their stock so that it could sell for more. Because I'm sure when you're trying to figure out how much a company can sell for, you look at like stock prices and stuff like that to determine worth. So that is wild that alone my jaw was on the floor I was like what in the world did I just discover (laughs) I had no idea any of this was going on before like yeah it's just like if that's what your business is based off of just like slimy stuff like fraud and like I can't even imagine like the things that they're doing just to keep vendors on their website that's wild One current account executive at The Knot who has worked there for more than a decade claimed in recent texts obtained by Forbes that the company is making it nearly impossible for wedding vendors to cancel their contracts and they've hiked fees 30% to juice revenue. Quote, everybody's on auto renewal. You could have cancer and you can't get out of your contract, unquote. They wrote in the messages, quote, not only do I have to sell, I have to handle so many cancel calls, upset auto renewal calls. It's simply ridiculous. The ROI is the pit and they really, there's really nothing you can say to these people, but I have, I have to do what I have to do, unquote. So (laughs) basically these contracts are so hard to get out of. And like the fact that someone that... I think it's someone that used to work there. Oh yeah. Just like texts from where, okay. What are these texts from? What, what am I reading? Recent texts maybe. Okay. Whoever these texts are from, it's basically like someone being like, yo, I, my job is literally just handing people that are handling people that are upset with their auto renewal. Um, just saying that they want to cancel And the fact that like they've deal with all those calls, It's like, okay, if you're running a business and you are focused, you have to have like people that are 100% focused on just handling the backlash and the negative feedback that comes from your product instead of charging people more money and trapping more people into your little scam. I, I'm just going to call it a scam trapping people into your business. How about instead we focus our, our effort into, okay, how can we get less negative feedback and less negative calls and less people wanting to cancel so that I'm actually improving my product so that it actually becomes worth people's while. And then they actually want to stay in the business. They actually want to work with us because we're giving them something that's valuable. Like at what point did we just completely stop doing that? 
Like, when did we stop trying to be good businesses? Like, that's just wild to me. So, I don't know. Like, the fact that this one just has to deal with all these cancel calls, like, I feel like they really need to ask themselves, like, okay, why are so many people trying to cancel? Like, why are there so many upset clients? Like, that's the issue. The issue is not like, oh, we're not making enough money and we need to keep trapping more people into this. The issue is, why is my product not valuable enough in the first place? And that's all I have to say about that. Okay, next thing in this Forbes article. Survey data shows that word of mouth recommendations and internet searches are today more integral to wedding planning than websites like like The Knot and Wedding Wire. So kind of the point that I made earlier, it's becoming way more valuable to just Google something or hear it from your friend or whatever who their photographer was, who their makeup artist was, that's way more valuable to people than something like the Knot and Wedding Wire. And I think people are really starting to discover that you can't trust some of this info that's on the Knot. You can just remove a negative review on the Knot. Like, that's just what can happen on a website like that. Whereas, like, if your friend had a bad experience, that's valuable. And you're going to listen to that. If your friend had a good experience, you know you can trust that. And I think another big thing with our generation, you know, like millennials, Gen Z, I think a lot of people are, I say millennials and Gen Z because technically I'm Gen Z, but I'm like right on the edge of millennials. So like I'm hitting both markets here. We really value like finding things on our own, which I think is kind of interesting. Like I, like word of mouth is definitely valuable to millennials and Gen Z, but I think a lot of people like to be different, you know, like they like to go and find their own photographer. Like they like to be like, Oh, I found this photographer and I'm obsessed. And I found them all on my own, like through TikTok or through Google or whatever, maybe not through TikTok anymore. I think it's banned, but you know what I mean? I think people are, are more into that. Like I found something that that's really unique, someone that I really like, and I found them on my own. And like, it's kind of like an individual type of mindset. Whereas before I feel like with wedding planning and all that, it was just kind of like, you know, Oh, you go on the knot and find like someone that's top rated, whatever. Um, I think people are really more into taking risks on smaller artists. Like, you know, someone that's newer or smaller. Like, I think people are really into that. You know, it kind of gives like a niche, unique vibe. Like, oh, I like looked like a small like caterer, like a really quaint caterer. They only do like three weddings a year and they're one of them is mine. Like people are really into that. Like, and honestly, I am too. Like, I'm not going to lie. I am 100% into that. So I think that's kind of more valuable right now in the wedding industry rather than the knot and wedding wire, finding someone organically on social media, like that's what people really value. And those are the people that they are going to book. So I have my advice and then we're, I'm going to read to you this crazy story from Reddit <laughs> and then we're going to be done. Okay. Cause you guys have things to do on your Monday. So let me just give you some advice. Okay. And just my opinion So take it with a grain of salt. In my opinion, I think most Americans are gonna, most Americans are shopping for around like $3,000 wedding vendors on the knot. And I think I found an article that said that or something, but like, I thought that that was so true. Like if you're going to be on a website like the knot or wedding wire, I feel like $3,000 really is that price range where that people are willing to spend. That's kind of the average budget of someone on that website. Okay. If you charge anything more than that, those types of clients find their vendors through either a planner or a venue or through word of mouth or social media if someone's budget is so high, like 10 grand, they are not going on the knot or wedding wire to find their photographer. They're just not like they are finding someone that they really value, someone that they have followed on social media for years and years and years. They're using someone that the venue recommends and absolutely loves. They're using someone that their best friend used. Okay. Higher budget 
weddings are most likely not going to be on the knot or wedding wire looking for a vendor. Okay. If you're going to be on the knot or wedding wire, if you're already locked in, okay. If you're already on it, you're like, I'm there. Can't get out of, out of it. A few tips for you. Okay. Just, uh, you know, try to make a bad thing good for you. Okay. Um, your photos have to be so different on the knot. I think that that is what made me personally pretty successful on the knot. Not saying, oh my gosh, I'm so different and unique. But I specifically, when I was putting together my storefront, thought to myself, how can I make my photos stand out from everyone else? So I looked on the rankings, like the first and second page of the knot. I went and looked at all the cover photos for, you know, the entire two pages. Because I think I was like on the bottom of the first page or like the top of the second page. I don't remember. But basically I went and looked at all my competition. I looked at their first photo and I discovered that no one really had any candid real moments from wedding day. It was all like pretty sunset portraits or like, you know, a crazy editorial style shoot or something like that. None of it was like actual real moments. So that was really what I like loaded up my storefront with was tons and tons of moments from wedding day. Like I, my first shot was like a dancing shot. My second shot was like someone crying during their vows. My third shot was like a really cute first look. Like it was just like moment after moment after moment. And I think I really made myself stand out in that way only because I just was looking at all the competition and seeing what was lacking. Basically. I'm sure these other people had great portfolios, tons of moments in their work, but they just weren't putting that on their storefront. So, um, your photos have to different differentiate themselves. You've got to rank at least like the first page or two, and you've got to have a plethora of reviews on the knot. And I think that's where, like, that's where the knot gets hard because it's like, once you're locked into the knot, you're like, well, I'm already here. I might as well ask people to leave me reviews on there. And then you have a ton of reviews on the knot. And then you go and maybe you want to start using Google instead. You have zero reviews on Google. And then it's like, oh, now I got to go like get more reviews on Google. And so I think that's what's hard about it. And then if you do rank on page one or two on the knot, it's really expensive. For me, when I was doing it, it was only like maybe $2,000 a year, like nothing crazy. But now I've heard it gets like upwards of like $10,000 to be on the first or second page of the knot. Which it's like, okay, that is absolutely insane. (laughs) So my recommendation is to start on Google and don't even mess around with like Wedding Pro, The Knot, Wedding Wire, um, because I think Google obviously is here to stay. And um, I think that's really like the best place you can build up a bunch of reviews is on Google. Um, And that kind of, that's going to help you grow. And I feel like when you get reviews on The Knot, ultimately that's kind of hard to transfer over somewhere else. And it's like, like you're kind of helping the knot, like you're helping your knot storefront. You're not really helping yourself with that. And you're just not really, that's not really helping you in the long run. I think in the long run, getting Google reviews is going to help you the most. So my best advice, start on Google. Don't even mess around with wedding pros. Instead of investing in something like wedding pros, invest in yourself. So invest in education and Google ads, Instagram ads, et cetera. Um, those things are going to help you build your business in the long run. Doing an Instagram ad is going to be way more, if you run it right, it's going to be more effective for you because you're going to get followers and you're going to get brand awareness. Whereas on the knot, it's like not really, (laughs) the knot is not, it's just not really, it's not really the same. I don't think the knot is really helping you build your business. It's more just like draining your business. Um, okay. So I found an article, um, from Emily's photography dot blog. And I mean, I loved this article. It literally was like, here's why the knots a scam. And I was like, yes, Emily. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. So the knot specifically releases articles. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but if you ever go to Google, like, um, what, like Michigan wedding photographers literally go and Google it. The top thing that pops up is a not article like they are the top ranking number one thing to pop up 
And I think it's because they make all of these articles. Um, and you know, it'll be like the best or the top photographers in Detroit, Michigan, and it'll, you know, they'll have these articles. They're basically killing the SEO game. But with that being said, the not doesn't necessarily have a list of the best photographers in Detroit, Michigan, because not every photographer is on the knot. They're only choosing photographers that are on the knot. And not only that, they're choosing the people that pay the most to rank number one, two, three, four, five on the knot. And those are the people who are the best photographers in Detroit, Michigan, but they're the people who can pay the most to be ranked best photographers in Detroit, Michigan. So it's, it's giving slimy. It's just not, it's snaky. It feels weird. Um, and honestly, these articles that they make are just clickbait. They really are just clickbait to get people on the knot. There's really no way to tell who the top Detroit photographers are. And all the people that are on the knot are not necessarily going to be, like I said, the top photographers. They're not going to be like professionals. And then let's talk about the fact that the knot gives out these like badges, um, like the best of weddings, 2023, like the knot awards, best of weddings, 2023. And you get a badge if you're literally just on the knot, if you pay for a subscription to a knot, you get a badge that says like the best of weddings. And then I think you get like another badge if you get a certain amount of reviews or something like that. I could be wrong about that. Um, but basically they give out these badges. They're misleading because you literally pay for the badge essentially. So, um, that's not great. It's very misleading for clients. And like I mentioned earlier, if you have a negative review on the knot, it can be removed very easily. So, that's just kind of like my advice, my two cents. Do I think it's a scam in that they send fake leads? Well, that leads me perfectly into my Reddit story for you guys. Okay. I, so this is not me. This is someone from Reddit. I finally got to the end of the year long contract. I got myself into last year with the knot. The year was full of useless scam inquiries that wasted my time on top of the money wasted on being a part of this supposed advertising site. This company delivers extremely poor treatment of vendors and a vast lack of monitoring for scammers that permeate its site. To top of the year, I had two scam inquiries just yesterday, both persistently communicating and one even with a phone call from a guy with such poor broken English he couldn't even understand what I was saying and a really bad phone connection. Both inquiries gave venues and dates for their supposed weddings, which upon verifying, neither venue had reservations for these bogus inquiries. One of the venues stated that I was one of three photographers who had called to verify about the scammer. I have read Wedding Pro, I have read Wedding Pro the Raya Act on the level. Okay, wait, that doesn't make any sense, but I'll read the sentence anyway. I have read Wedding Pro the Raya Act on the level of extremely poor security from their website. They just throw stats at me about how much inquiry activity my business received, ignoring the fact that it was at a bare minimum 95% bogus inquiries from scammers. I hope this answers the question for anyone thinking of signing up with them that Wedding Pro itself is operating as a frontline partner for these scammers by refusing to beef up their security in the name of, quote, oh well, but unquote. It works for some businesses, but not for mine. It's expensive as heck with an ironclad contract that contains a hidden agreement that you will auto renew at the end of your first year. And they will make it extremely complicated ducking and dodging you and only allowing a very short little window and amb ambiguous directions for how to cancel at the end of the year for your contract. The site is overpopulated with wedding companies who occupy the premium listing spots because they have very deep pockets. Wedding Pro, aka Wedding Wire in the Knot, does not serve the vendors who are paying for their site with hard-earned advertising dollars. Stay away from it or use it at your own peril of finding out for yourselves what ripoff what a ripoff Wedding Pro is. 
This is a real and serious review of a real experience and a widely held opinion by most vendors on the site. Wedding Pro tries to lure you in by telling you that it will only take one or two bookings to pay for the advertising fee. Don't fall for it. You will spend most of your first year batting off scammers like mosquitoes. There are better ways to find and retain clients than to go fishing in the dirty pond of Wedding Pro. Dang. (laughs) That last line is like such a mic drop. Wow. Than to go fishing in the dirty pond of a wedding pro. I wish I could write like that. That's amazing. Okay. So I just kind of had this revelation and I'll wrap it up here that maybe I could see wedding pro sending fake inquiries. Like I could see them, you know, sending out these, these fake leads to kind of just like let you know, oh, you're getting, you're getting leads from us, but like, they're not actually real. I could see them doing that. But also I never thought of the fact that there are scammers not associated with wedding pro that could be using wedding pro as a means to prey on maybe insecure or vulnerable vendors who aren't necessarily getting booking. So they're a little bit desperate for bookings. So they go on these websites and then they can pretty easily bait and get you. And, you know, I don't even know how these scams work sometimes like these (laughs) people that scam vendors. I don't know how, I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what the latest scam is. I remember back in my day, it was like someone would be like, Oh, I want to book with you. And then they'd be like, I'm going to send you a check in the mail. And they send you a check and you go to cash it and it doesn't work. And then they'll be like, oh, you have to like send me a check. Like I sent you a check for $5,000, but like, can you send me a check back for $2,500? Because like I could only like, I don't even know. (laughs) And then it would be this whole thing where basically these scammers try to get you to send a check to them, like a real check. Um, So don't fall for it scammers could be using wedding pro to scam you. Maybe the scammers are wedding pro. I don't know, but either way, that's the tea I have for you this episode. And wow. Oh, wow. Was there tea? Do your own research, you know, decide if that's something that you want to be a part of decide if you're already locked in to the knot, let's get you out of it. Or, you know, after your years up, really work on finding that window for getting out that would be my advice personally. Um, I think it's changed a lot since I've been on the knot. Um, I've said this before, but I had a pretty decent experience my first couple years on the knot. I think I was only on the knot for a total of two years. My first year was amazing because I was brand new. I didn't really have any way of getting leads. And then Essentially, I was living in a touristy area where people were coming and getting married and needed a place to find vendors. And the knot was a great place for people to find vendors in touristy areas. So it worked for me. However, when I moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, I discovered that people weren't really looking for their vendors on there. So I have mixed mixed feelings about it because, you know, it got me some really awesome weddings some weddings that I, you know, loved and had a great time shooting. The people were great, whatever, but you know, at what cost? Like I was definitely weeding through so many fake leads, you know, and eventually there was a point where I was only getting fake leads and I wasn't booking anything from there anymore. Um, so take it how you may. And that is all I have to say for this episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, yeah, take this piping tea with you for the rest of the week. Really simmer on it. DM me. Let me know what you think. And I will see you next week for another episode. Have a great rest of your day.